Ezra chapter 7 After these things, during the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, the son of Shalom, the son of Zadok, the son of Ahitub, the son of Amariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Meraoth, the son of Zerahiah, the son of Azai, the son of Bukai, the son of Abishua, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a teacher, well versed in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted everything he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, including priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, and temple servants, also came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the fifth month of the seventh year of the king. He had begun his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month, and he arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, for the gracious hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord, and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. This is a copy of the letter King Artaxerxes had given to Ezra the priest, a teacher of the law, a man learned in matters concerning the commands and decrees of the Lord for Israel. Artaxerxes, King of Kings, to Ezra the priest, teacher of the law of the God of heaven. Greetings. Now I decree that any of the Israelites in my kingdom, including priests and Levites, who volunteer to go to Jerusalem with you, may go. You are sent by the king and his seven advisers to inquire about Judah and Jerusalem with regard to the law of your God which is in your hand. Moreover, you are to take with you the silver and gold that the king and his advisers have freely given to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, together with all the silver and gold you may obtain from the province of Babylon, as well as the free will offerings of the people and priests for the temple of their God in Jerusalem. With this money, be sure to buy bulls, rams, and male lambs, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, and sacrifice them on the altar of the temple of your God in Jerusalem. You and your fellow Israelites may then do whatever seems best with the rest of the silver and gold, in accordance with the will of your God. Deliver to the God of Jerusalem all the articles entrusted to you for worship in the temple of your God and anything else needed for the temple of your God that you are responsible to supply, you may provide from the royal treasury. Now I, King Artaxerxes, decree that all the treasurers of Trans-Euphrates are to provide with diligence whatever Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law of the God of heaven, may ask of you, up to a hundred talents of silver, a hundred cores of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, a hundred baths of olive oil and salt, without limit. Whatever the God of heaven has prescribed, let it be done with diligence for the temple of the God of heaven. Why should his wrath fall on the realm of the king and of his sons? You are also to know that you have no authority to impose taxes, tribute or duty on any of the priests, Levites, musicians, gatekeepers, temple servants, or other workers at this house of God. And you, Ezra, in accordance with the wisdom of your God which you possess, appoint magistrates and judges to administer justice to all the people of Trans-Euphrates, all who know the laws of your God. And you are to teach any who do not know them. Whoever does not obey the law of your God and the law of the king must surely be punished by death, banishment, confiscation of property, or imprisonment. Praise be to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who has put it into the king's heart to bring honor to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem in this way, and who has extended his good favor to me before the king and his advisers, and all the king's powerful officials. Because the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. Ezra chapter 8 These are the family heads and those registered with them, 
who came up with me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. Of the descendants of Phineas, Gershom. Of the descendants of Ithamar, Daniel. Of the descendants of David, Hattush of the descendants of Shechaniah. Of the descendants of Perosh, Zechariah, and with him were registered a hundred and fifty men. Of the descendants of Pehath Moab, Eli Ehoenai, son of Zechariah, and with him two hundred men. Of the descendants of Zatu, Shechaniah, son of Jehaziel, and with him three hundred men. Of the descendants of Adin, Ebed, son of Jonathan, and with him fifty men. Of the descendants of Elam, Jeshiah, son of Ataliah, and with him seventy men. Of the descendants of Shephatiah, Zebediah, son of Michael, and with him eighty men. Of the descendants of Joab, Obadiah, son of Jehiel, and with him two hundred and eighteen men. Of the descendants of Bani, Shalomith, son of Josephiah, and with him a hundred and sixty men. Of the descendants of Bebei, Zechariah, son of Bebei, and with him twenty-eight men. Of the descendants of Asgad, Johanan, son of Hakatan, and with him one hundred and ten men. Of the descendants of Adonikam, the last ones whose names were Eliphalet, Jewel, and Shemaiah, and with them sixty men. Of the descendants of Bigvei, Utei, and Zakar, and with them seventy men. I assembled them at the canal that flows towards Ahava, and we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there. So I summoned Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jarib, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Mushulam, who were leaders, and Joyarib and Elnathan, who were men of learning. And I ordered them to go to Iddo, the leader in Cassiphiah. I told them what to say to Iddo and his fellow Levites, the temple servants in Cassiphiah, so that they might bring attendance to us for the house of our God. Because the gracious hand of our God was on us, they brought us Sherebiah, a capable man from the descendants of Marli, son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherebiah's sons and brothers, eighteen in all. And Hashabiah, together with Jeshiah, from the descendants of Merari, and his brothers and nephews, twenty men in all. They also brought two hundred and twenty of the temple servants, a body that David and the officials had established to assist the Levites. All were registered by name. There, by the Ahava Canal, I proclaimed a fast, so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask Him for a safe journey for us and our children with all our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road, because we had told the king, The gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to Him, but His great anger is against all who forsake Him. So we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and He answered our prayer. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, namely Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brothers, and I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisers, his officials, and all Israel present there had donated for the house of our God. I weighed out to them six hundred and fifty talents of silver, silver articles weighing a hundred talents, one hundred talents of gold, twenty bowls of gold valued at one thousand darics, and two fine articles of polished bronze as precious as gold. I said to them, You, as well as these articles, are consecrated to the Lord. The silver and gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Guard them carefully until you weigh them out in the chambers of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem before the leading priests and the Levites and the family heads of Israel. Then the priests and Levites received the silver and gold and sacred articles that had been weighed out to be taken to the house of our God in Jerusalem. On the twelfth day of the first month, we set out from the Ahava Canal to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and He protected us from enemies and bandits along the way. So we arrived in Jerusalem, where we rested three days. On the fourth day, in the house of our God, we weighed out the silver and gold and the sacred articles 
into the hands of Meremoth, son of Uriah the priest. Eleazar, son of Phinehas, was with him, and so were the Levites, Josabad, son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, son of Binuai. Everything was accounted for by number and weight, and the entire weight was recorded at that time. Then the exiles, who had returned from captivity, sacrificed burnt offerings to the God of Israel. Twelve bulls for all Israel, ninety-six rams, seventy-seven male lambs, and, as a sin offering, twelve male goats. All this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's orders to the royal satraps and to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, who then gave assistance to the people and to the house of God. Ezra chapter 9 After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, and have mingled the holy race with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. When I heard this, I tore my tunic and cloak, pulled hair from my head and beard, and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel gathered round me because of this unfaithfulness of the exiles. And I sat there appalled until the evening sacrifice. Then, at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self-abasement, with my tunic and cloak torn, and fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you, because our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. From the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. But now, for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. He has granted us new life to rebuild the house of our God and repair its ruins. And he has given us a wall of protection in Judah and Jerusalem. But now, our God, what can we say after this? For we have forsaken the commands you gave through your servants the prophets when you said, the land you are entering to possess is a land polluted by the corruption of its peoples. By their detestable practices they have filled it with their impurity from one end to the other. Therefore do not give your daughters in marriage to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them at any time that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land and leave it to your children as an everlasting inheritance. What has happened to us is a result of our evil deeds and our great guilt. And yet, our God, you have punished us less than our sins have deserved and have given us a remnant like this. Shall we then break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit such detestable practices? Would you not be angry enough with us to destroy us, leaving us no remnant or survivor? Lord, the God of Israel, you are righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt, though because of it not one of us can stand in your presence. Acts chapter 26 Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, 
I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defence against all the accusations of the Jews, and especially so, because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I have lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, and can testify, if they are willing, that I conformed to the strictest sect of our religion living as a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. And that is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defence. "'You are out of your mind, Paul!' he shouted. "'Your great learning is driving you insane!' "'I am not insane, most excellent Festus,' Paul replied. "'What I am saying is true and reasonable. "'The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. "'I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, "'because it was not done in a corner.' King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long. I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man 
is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Psalm 12 Help, Lord, for no one is faithful any more. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbor, they flatter with their lips, but harbor deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say, by our tongues we will prevail, our own lips will defend us, who is Lord over us? Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honored by the human race. Proverbs chapter 7 My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, You are my sister. And to insight, You are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman from the wayward woman with her seductive words. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple. I noticed among the young men a youth who had no sense. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house, at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Then out came a woman to meet him dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner she lurks. She took hold of him and kissed him, and with a brazen face she said, Today I fulfilled my vows, and I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you, and have found you. I have covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink deeply of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took his purse filled with money and will not be home till full moon. With persuasive words she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. All at once he followed her, like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing it will cost him his life. Now then, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death.